when shall we three meet again? In thunder, lightning, or in rain? When the hurly burly's done, when the battle's lost and won, that will be ere the set of sun. Where the place? Upon the heath. There to meet with Macbeth. I come, Grimmauldin. Foul and, and foul is fair. Hover through the fog and, and, and fill, fill the air. Bloody man is that? He can report as seemeth by his plight of the revolt the new estate. This is the sergeant, who, like a good and hardy soldier, fought against my captivity. Hail, brave friend! Say to the king the knowledge of the broil, as thou didst leave it. Doubtful it stood, as two spent swimmers that do cling together and choke their art. The merciless MacDonald, worthy to be a rebel, for to that the multiplying villainies of nature do swarm upon him. From the western isles of kerns and gallow glasses is supplied, and fortune on his damned quarrel smiling showed like a rebel's whore. But all's too weak for brave Macbeth. Well, he deserved that name, disdaining fortune with his brandished steel which smoked with bloody execution, like Valor's minion carved out his passage till he faced the slave, which ne'er shook hands nor bade farewell to him till he unseen him from the nave to the chaps and fixed his head upon our battlements. Oh, valiant cousin, worthy gentleman. Mark, King of Scotland, Mark. No sooner justice had, with valour armed, compelled these skipping kerns to trust their heels, but the Norwegian lord, surveying vantage with furbished arms and new supplies of men, began a fresh assault. Dismayed not this our captains, Macbeth and Banquo? <laughs> As sparrows, eagles, or the hare, the lion. Huh. <laughs> if I say sooth, I must report. They were as cannons, overcharged with double cracks, so they doubly redoubled strokes upon the foe. Except they meant to bathe in reeking wounds or memorize another Golgotha, I cannot tell. But I am faint, my gashes cry for help. So will thy words become thee as thy wounds, they smack of honor both. Go get him, surgeons. My lord. Uh, who comes here? The worthy pain of Ross. What haste looks through his eyes. So should he look that seems to speak things strange. God save the king. Whence came so, worthy Thane? From Fife, great king, where the Norwegian banners flout the sky and fan our people cold. Norway himself, with terrible numbers, assisted by that most disloyal traitor, the Thane of Cawdor, began a dismal conflict till that Bellona's bridegroom, lapped in proof, confronted him with self-comparisons, point against point, rebellious arm against arm, curbing his lavish spirit. And to conclude, the victory fell on us. Oh. Great happiness. No more that Thane of Cora shall deceive our bosom interest. Go pronounce his present death, and with his former title, greet Macbeth. I'll see it done. What he hath lost, noble Macbeth, Half one! Sister, where thou? A sailor's wife had chestnuts in her lap, and mouched, and mouched, and mouched. Give me, quoth I. Out 
mighty witch, the rampant Ronian cries. Uh, her husband's to Aleppo gone, master of the tiger. But in a sieve I'll thither sail, and like a rat without a tail, I'll do, and I'll do, and I'll do. I'll give thee a wine. A kind. And I another. I myself have all the other. And the very ports they blow, all the quarters that they know, with a shipman's card. I'll drain him, dry as hay. Ah. Sleep shall neither night nor day hang upon his penthouse lid. He shall live a man forbid. Weary Senites, nine times nine, shall he dwindle, peak and pine. Though his bark cannot be lost, yet it shall be tempest tossed. What I have. Show me, show me. Here I have a pile of thumb, wrecked as homeward he did come. A drum, a drum. Macbeth doth come. The weird sisters, hand in hand, posters of the sea and land, thus to go about, about. Thrice to thine, and thrice to mine, and thrice again to make up nine. So foul and fair a day I have not seen. How far is call to forest? <gasps> what are these? So withered and so wild in their attire, but look not like the inhabitants of the earth, and yet are aren't. Live you? Or are you aught that man may question? <sighs> you seem to understand me by each at once her choppy finger laying upon her skinny lips. You should be women. And yet your beards forbid me to interpret that you are so. Speak if you can. What are you? All hail, Macbeth. Hail to the Thane of Glams. All hail, Macbeth. Hail to the Thane of Cawdor. All hail, Macbeth. That shalt be king hereafter. Huh? Good sir, why do you start and seem to fear things that do sound so fair? In the name of truth, are ye fantastical or that indeed which outwardly ye show? My noble partner, you greet with present grace and great prediction of noble having and of royal hope that he seems wrapped with all. To me, you speak not. If you can look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not, speak then to me, who neither beg nor fear your favors nor your hate. Banquo, hail. 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 Lesser than Macbeth and greater. Not so happy, yet much happier. Thou shalt get kings, though thou be none. So all hail Macbeth and Banquo. Banquo and Macbeth, all hail. Stay, you imp. Perfect speakers, tell me more. By Simul's death, I know I am Thane of Glans, but how of Cordor? The Thane of Cordor lives, a prosperous gentleman, and to be king stands not within the prospect of belief, no more than to be Cordor. Say from whence you owe this strange intelligence, or why upon this blasted heath you stop our way with such prophetic greeting. Speak, I charge you. <laughs> Earth hath bubbles as the water has, and these are of them. Whither are they banished? Into the air. And what seemed corporal melted as breath into the wind. Would they had stayed. Were such things here as we do speak about? Or have we eaten on the insane root that takes the reason prisoner? Your children shall be kings. You shall be kings. And Thane of Cordor, too. Went it not so? To the selfsame tune and words. Who's here? The Thanes of Angus and of Ross. The king hath happily received, Macbeth, the news of thy success. 
And when he reads thy personal venture in the rebels' fight, his wonders and his praises do contend which should be thine or his. As thick as hail came post with post, and every one did bear thy praises in his kingdom's great defense, and poured them down before him. And for an earnest of a greater honor, he bade me from him call thee Thane of Cordor. Huh? In which addition, hail, most worthy Thane, for it is thine. What? Can the devil speak true? The Thane of Cordor lives. Why do you dress me in borrowed robes? Who was the Thane lives yet, but under heavy judgment bears that life which he deserves to lose. Clams and Thane of Cordor. The greatest is behind. Thanks for your pains. Do you not hope your children shall be kings when those that gave the Thane of Cordor to me promised no less to them? That trusted home might yet enkindle you unto the crown besides the Thane of Cordor. But tis strange, and oftentimes to win us to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truths, win us with honest trifles to betray us in deepest consequence. Cousins, a word I pray you. Two truths are told as happy prologues to the swelling act of the imperial theme. I thank you, gentlemen. This supernatural soliciting cannot be ill, cannot be good. If ill, why hath it given me earnest of success commencing in a truth? I am Thane of Cordor. If good, why do I yield to that suggestion? whose horrid image doth unfix my hair and make my seated heart knock at my ribs against the use of nature. Present fears are less than horrible imaginings. My thought, whose murder yet is but fantastical, shakes so my single state of man that function is smothered in surmise and nothing is but what is not. Look how our partner's wrapped. If chance will have me king, why chance may crown me without my stir. New honors come upon him, like our strange garments, cleave not to their mold, but with the aid of use. <laughs> come what come may, time and the hour runs through the roughest day. Worthy Macbeth, we stay upon your leisure. Give me your favor. <laughs> My dull brain was wrought with things forgotten. Kind gentlemen, your pains are registered where every day I turn the leaf to read them. Let us toward the king. Think upon what hath chanced. And at more time, the interim having weighed it, let us speak our free hearts each to other. Very gladly. Till then, enough. Come, friends. Is execution done on Cordor? Are not those in commission yet returned? My liege, they are not yet come back. But I have spoke with one that saw him die, who did report that very frankly he confessed his treasons, implored your highness pardon, and set forth a deep repentance. Nothing in his life became him like the leaving it. He died as one that had been studied in his death, to throw away the dearest thing he owed as to a careless trifle. Uh, there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. He was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. <laughs> oh, worthiest Macbeth, the sin of my ingratitude even now is heavy on me. Thou art so far before that swiftest wing of recompense is slow to overtake thee. <laughs> Wouldst thou hadst less deserved that the proportion both of thanks and payment might have been mine. Only I have left to say, more is thy due than more than all can pay. The service and the loyalty I owe in doing it pays itself. Your Highness part is to receive our duties, and our duties are to your throne and state, children and servants, which do but what they should by doing everything safe toward your love and honor. Welcome hither. I have begun to plant thee and will labor to make thee full of growing. Noble Banquo, thou hast no less deserved, nor must be known no less to have done so. Let me enfold thee and hold thee to my heart. There, if I grow, the harvest is your own. My plenteous joys, wanton in fullness, 
seek to hide themselves in drops of sorrow. Sons, kinsmen, friends, and you whose places are the nearest, know we will establish our estate upon our eldest, Malcolm, whom we name hereafter the Prince of Cumberland. <laughs> which honor must not unaccompanied invest him only, but signs of nobleness like stars shall shine on all deservers. From hence to Inverness, and bind us further to you. The rest is labor which is not used for you. I'll be myself the harbinger and make joyful the hearing of my wife with your approach. So humbly take my leave. My worthy Cordon. The Prince of Cumberland. That is a step on which I must fall down or else or leap. For in my way it lies. Stars hide your fires. Let not light see my black and deep desires. The eye wink at the hand. Yet let that be which the eye fears when it is done to see. They met me in the day of success. And I have learned by the perfect's report they have more in them than mortal knowledge. When I burnt in desire to question them further, they made themselves air into which they vanished. Whilst I stood wrapped in the wonder of it came missives from the king who all hailed me Thane of Cordor, by which title before these weird sisters saluted me and referred me to the coming on of time with Hail King that shalt be. As if I thought good to deliver thee, my dearest partner of greatness, that thou mightst not lose the dues of rejoicing by being ignorant of what greatness is promised thee. Lay it to thy heart and farewell. Glance, thou art. And Cordor. And shalt be what thou art promised. Yet do I fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Thou wouldst be great, art not without ambition, but without the illness should attend it. What thou wouldst highly, that wouldst thou holily, wouldst not play false, and yet wouldst wrongly win. Thou'dst have great glance, that which cries, Thus thou must do, if thou have it, And that which rather thou dost fear to do, Than wishest should be undone. I thee that I may pour my spirits in thine ear, And chastise with the valour of my tongue, all that impedes thee from the golden round which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have thee crowned withal. What is your tidings? The king comes here tonight. Hot mad to say it. Is not thy master with him? Who were so would have informed for preparation. So please you, it is true. Our thane is coming. One of my fellows had the speed of him, who almost dead for breath had scarcely more than would make up his message. Give him tending. He brings great news. My lady. <laughs> the raven himself is horse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. You spirits attend on mortal thoughts. Unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood. Stop up the access and passage to remorse. But no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell purpose nor keep peace between the effect and it. Come to my woman's breasts, 
and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers. Whatever in your sightless substances you wait on nature's mischief, come, thick night, and pour thee in the dunnest smoke of hell, that my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry, hold, hold. My dearest love. Great glums. Worthy Cordor. Greater than both by the all hail hereafter. Thy letters have transported me beyond this ignorant present. And I feel now the future in the instant. Duncan comes here tonight. And when goes hence? Tomorrow, as he purposes. <laughs> Never shall sun that morrow see. Face my fame is as a book where men may read strange matters. To beguile the time, look like the time. Bear welcome in your eye, your hand, your tongue. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. He that's coming must be provided for. And you shall put this night's great business into my dispatch which shall to all our nights and days to come give solely sovereign sway and masterdom. We will speak further. Only look up, clear. To alter favor ever is to fear. Leave all the rest to me. This castle hath a pleasant seat. The air nimbly and sweetly recommends itself unto our gentle senses. This guest of summer, the temple-haunting martlet, does approve by his loved mansionry that the heaven's breath smells wooingly here. No jutty, frieze, buttress, nor coin of vantage, but this bird hath made his pendant bed and procreant cradle. Where they most breed and haunt, I have observed the air is delicate. See! See our honoured hostess. The love that follows us sometimes is our trouble, which still we thank as love. <laughs> Here did I teach you how you shall bid God ild us for your pains and thank us for your trouble. All our service, in every point twice done and then done double, were poor and single business to contend against those honours deep and broad wherewith your majesty loads our house. For those of old and the late dignities heaped up to them, we rest your hermit. Where's the thane of Cordor? We cursed him at the heels and had a purpose to be his purveyor. <laughs> but he rides well, and his great love, sharp as his spur, hath helped him to his home before us. Fair and noble hostess, we are your guest tonight. Servants ever have theirs themselves and what is theirs in compt to make their audit at your highness' pleasure still to return your own. Give me your hand. Conduct me to mine host. We love him highly and shall continue our graces towards him. By your leave, hostess. If it were done, when tis done, then twere well, it were done quickly. If the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his surcease success, that but this blow might be the be-all and the end-all here. But here, upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. But in these cases, we still have judgment here, that we but teach bloody instructions, which being taught return to plague the inventor. This even-handed justice 
commends the ingredients of our poisoned chalice to our own lips. He's here in double trust. First, as I am his kinsman and his subject, strong both against the deed. Then, as his host, who should against the murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. Besides this, Duncan hath borne his faculties so meek, hath been so clear in his great office, that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet-tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off. And pity, like a naked newborn babe, striding the blast, or heaven's cherubim, horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air, shall blow the horrid deed in every eye, the tears shall drown the wind. I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition, which o'erleaps itself and falls on the other. And now what news? He has almost supped. Why have you left the chamber? Have he asked for me? No, you not. He has. And we will proceed no further in this business. He hath honored me of late, and I have bought golden opinions from all sorts of people, which should be worn now in their newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Hath it slept since and wakes it now to look so green and pale at what it did so freely? From this time, such I account thy love. Art thou afear to be the same in thine own act and valor as thou art in desire? Wouldst thou have that which thou esteemst the ornament of life, and live a coward in thine own esteem, letting I dare not wait upon I would like the poor cat of the adage? Pretty peace. I dare do all that may become a man. Who dares do more is none. What beast was then that made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more the man. Nor time nor place did them adhere, and yet you would make both. They have made themselves, and that their fitness now does unmake you. I have given suck, and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out, had I so sworn as you have done to this. If we should fail. We fail. But screw your courage to the sticking place, and we'll not fail. And Duncan is asleep. Whereto the rather shall his day's hard journey soundly invite him, his two chamberlains will I, with wine and wassail, so convince that memory the warder of the brain shall be a fume, and the receipt of reason a limbeck only, when in swinish sleep. Their drenched natures lie as in a death. What cannot you and I perform upon the unguarded Duncan? What not put upon his spongy officers, who shall bear the guilt of our great quell? Bring forth men, children only, for thy undaunted metal should compose nothing but males. Will it not be received? When we have marked with blood those sleepy two of his own chamber and use their very daggers, that they have done it? Who dares receive it, other, as we shall make our griefs and clamor roar upon his death? I am settled and bend up each corporal agent to this terrible feat. Away and mock the time with fairest show. False face must hide what the false heart. goes the night, boy? The moon is down. I have not heard the clock. And she goes down at twelve. I take tis later, sir. Hold. Take my sword. Sir? There's husbandry in heaven. Their candles are all out. Uh, take thee that, too. Oh. A heavy summons lies like lead upon me. And yet I would not sleep. Merciful powers restrain in me the cursed thoughts that nature gives way to in repose. Give me my sword. Who's there? A friend. What, sir? Not yet at rest? The king's abed? He hath been in unusual pleasure and sent forth great largesse to your offices. 
This diamond he greets your wife withal by the name of most kind hostess and shut up in measureless content. Being unprepared, our will became the servant to defect, which else should free have wrought. All's well. I dreamt last night of the three weird sisters. To you, they have showed some truth. I think not of them. Yet when we can entreat an hour to serve, we would spend it in some words upon that business, if you would grant the time. At your kindest leisure. If you shall cleave to my consent when tis, it shall make honor for you. So I lose none in seeking to augment it, but still keep my bosom franchised and allegiance clear. I shall be counseled. Good repose the while. Thanks, sir. The like to you. Go bid thy mistress, when my drink is ready, she strike upon the bell. Get thee to bed. My lord. <sighs> is this a dagger which I see before me? The handle toward my hand? Come, let me clutch thee. I have thee not. And yet I see thee still. Art thou not, fatal vision, sensible to feeling as to sight? Or art thou but a dagger of the mind, a false creation proceeding from the heat-oppressed brain? I see thee yet, in form as palpable as this which now I draw. Thou marshalst me the way that I was going, and such an instrument I was to use. Mine eyes are made the fools of the other senses, or else worth all the rest. I see thee still, and on thy blade and dudgeon, gouts of blood, which was not so before. There's no such thing. It is the bloody business which informs thus to mine eyes. Now o'er the one half world, nature seems dead, and wicked dreams abuse the curtained sleep. Witchcraft celebrates pale Hecate's offerings and withered murder. Alarmed by his sentinel, the wolf, whose howls his watch, thus with his stealthy pace, with Tarquin's ravishing strides towards his design, moves like a ghost. Thou sure and firm, said Earth, hear not my steps which way they walk, for fear thy very stones prate of my whereabout, and take the present horror from the time which now suits with it. Whiles I threat, he lives, Words to the heat of deeds, too cold breath gives. I go, and it is done. The bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell which summons thee to heaven or to hell. Drunk hath made me bold. What hath quenched them hath given me fire. <gasps> Hark! Peace, it was the hour of retreat. The fatal bellman which gives the sternst good night. He is about it. The doors are open. And the surfeited grooms do mock their charge with snores. I have drugged their possets, that death and nature do contend about them, whether they live or die. Who's there? What I am afraid they have awaked and is not done. The attempt and not the deed confounds us. He laid the daggers ready. He could not miss them. Had he not resembled my father as he slept, I had done. Uh. 
My husband. I have done the deed. Didst thou not hear a noise? I heard the owls scream and the crickets cry. Did not you speak? When? Now. As I descended? I. Hark! Who lies in the second chamber? Donal, Ben. This is a sorry sight. A foolish thought to say a sorry sight. There's one did laugh in sleep, and one cried murder that they did wake each other. I stood and heard them, but they did say their prayers and address them again to sleep. There are two lodged together. One cried, God bless us, and amen the other, as they had seen me with these hangman's hands. Listening their fear, I could not say amen when they did say God bless us. Consider it not so deep. But wherefore could I not pronounce amen? I had most need of blessing and amen stuck in my throat. These deeds must not be thought after these ways, so it will make us mad. Methought I heard a voice cry, sleep no more. Macbeth does murder sleep. The innocent sleep. Sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care, the death of each day's life, sore labor's bar, balm of hurt minds, great nature's second course, chief nourisher in life's feast. What do you mean? Still it cried, sleep no more, to all the house, glams have murdered sleep, and therefore Cordor shall sleep no more. Macbeth shall sleep no more. Who was it that thus cried? Why, worthy Thane, you do unbend your noble strength to think so brain sickly of things. Go oh, get some water and wash this filthy witness from your hand. Why did you bring these daggers from the place? They must lie there. Go carry them and smear the sleepy grooms with blood. Now go no more! I am afraid to think what I have done. Look on it again, I dare not. Be firm of purpose, give me the daggers. The sleeping and the dead are but as pictures. Tis the eye of childhood that fears a painted devil. If he do bleed, I'll gild the faces of the grooms with all, for it must seem their guilt. Whence is that knocking? How is't with me when every noise appalls me? What hands are here? Ah, they pluck out mine eyes. Will all great Neptune's ocean wash this blood clean from my hand? No. This my hand will rather the multitudinous seas incarnadine, making the green one red. My hands are of your color, but I shame to wear a heart so white. <sighs> I hear a knocking at the south entry. Retire we to our chamber. A little water clears us of this deed. How easy is it then? Your constancy hath left you unattended. Hark, more knocking. Get on your night, God, lest occasion call us and show us to be watchers. Be not lost so poorly in your thoughts. To know my deed, to our best not know myself. Ah, wake, Duncan, with thy knocking! <laughs> I would thou couldst! Oh, uh, here's a knocking indeed. Uh, uh, if a man were porter of Elgate, he should have old turning the key. Knock, knock, knock. Who's there in the name of Beelzebub? Knock, knock, knock. Hey, knock, man, knock! (laughs) 
Oh, pray, you remember the porter. Was it so late, friend, eh? You went to bed that you do lie so late. Oh, face, sir. We've been carousing till the second cock. And drink, sir, is a great provoker of three things. Well, what three things does drink especially provoke? Many, sir. Nose painting, sleep, and urine. <laughs> uh, lechery, sir, it provokes and unprovokes. It, it provokes the desire, but it takes away the performance. Ah. Therefore, much drink may be said to be an equivocator with lechery. It makes him and it mars him. It sets him on and it takes him off. It persuades him and disheartens him. It makes him stand to and not stand to. <laughs> in conclusion, equivocates him in his sleep and, giving him the lie, leaves him. I believe drink gave thee the lie last night. That he did, sir, in the very throat of me. But uh, I requited him for his lie, and uh, I think, being too strong for him, though he took up my legs some time, yet I made a shift to cast him. Where's thy master stirring? Our knocking has awaked him. Here he comes. Good morrow, noble sir. Good morrow, both. Is the king stirring, worthy then? Not yet. He did command me to call timely on him. I've almost slipped the hour. I'll bring you to him. I know this is a joyful trouble to you, but yet it is one. The labour we delight in physics pain. This is the door. I'll make so bold to call, for tis my limited service. Goes the king hence today? He does. He did appoint so. The night has been unruly. Where we lay, our chimneys were blown down, and, as they say, lamentings heard in the air, strange screams of death, and prophesying with accents terrible of dire combustion and confused events new hatched to the woeful time. The obscure bird clamoured the livelong night. Some say the earth was feverous and did shake. It was a rough night. My young remembrance cannot parallel a fellow to it. Oh, horror! 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 Tongue nor heart cannot conceive nor name thee. What's the matter? Confusion now hath made his masterpiece. Most sacrilegious murder hath broke ope the Lord's anointed temple and stole thence the life of the building. What is you say? The life? I mean you his majesty. Approach the chamber and destroy your sight with a new gorgon. Do not bid me speak. See and then speak yourselves. Come, my lord. Awake! Awake! Ring the alarm bell! Murder and treason! Banquo and Donalbrain! Malcolm, awake! Shake off this downy sleep, death's counterfeit, and look on death itself! Up! Up! And see the great doom's image! Malcolm! Banquo, as from your graves, rise up and walk like sprites to countenance this horror. What's the business that such a hideous trumpet calls to parley the sleepers of the house? Speak, speak. Oh, gentle lady, it is not for you to hear what I can speak. The repetition in a woman's ear would murder as it fell. Oh, Banquo, Banquo, our royal masters murdered. Oh, alas. <laughs> What, in our house? Too cruel anywhere. Dear Duff, I pray thee contradict thyself and say it is not so. Had I but died an hour before this chance, I had lived a blessed time. For from this instant there's nothing serious in mortality. All is but toys. Renown and grace is dead. The wine of life is drawn, and the mere lees is left this vault to brag on. What is amiss? You are, and do not know it. The spring, the head, the fountain of your blood is stopped. The very source of it is stopped. Your royal father's murdered. By whom? Those of his chamber, as it seemed, had done. Their hands and faces were all badged with blood. So were their daggers, which unwiped we found upon their pillows. They stared and were distracted. No man's life was to be trusted with them. Oh, yet I do repent me of my fury that I did kill them. Wherefore did you so? Who can be wise, amazed, temperate and furious, loyal and neutral in a moment. No man. The expedition of my violent love outran the pauser, reason. 
Here lay Duncan, his silver skin laced with his golden blood, and his gashed stabs looked like a breach in nature for ruin's wasteful entrance. There, the murderers, steeped in the colors of their trade, their daggers unmannerly breached with gore. Who could refrain that had a heart to love, and in that heart, courage to make his love known? Oh, yes. Oh. Oh, Dr. The lady! You lady. Why do we hold our tongues? But most may claim this argument for ours. What should be spoken here? Where our fate hid in an auger hole may rush and seize us. Let's away. Our tears are not yet brewed. Or our strong sorrow upon the foot of motion. Look to the lady! And when we have our naked frailties hid that suffer in exposure, let us meet and question this most bloody piece of work to know it further. Fears and scruples shake us. In the great hand of God I stand. And thence against the undivulged pretense, I fight of treasonous malice. And so do I. Let's briefly put on manly readiness and meet in the hall together. Welcome. What will you do, Donald Bain? Let's not consort with them. To show an unfelt sorrow is an office which the false man does easy. I'll to England. To Ireland, I. Our separated fortune shall keep us both the safer. Where we are, there's daggers in men's smiles. The near in blood, the nearer bloody. This murderer's shaft that shot hath not yet lighted. And our safest way is to avoid the aim. Therefore to horse, and let us not be dainty of leave-taking, but chift away. There's warrant in that theft, which steals itself when there's no mercy left. it now. King, Cawdor, Glams, all as the weird women promised. And I fear thou plays most foully for it. Yet it was said it should not stand in thy posterity, but that myself should be the root and father of many kings. If there come truth from them, as upon thee, Macbeth, their speeches shine, why, by the verities on thee made good, may they not be my oracles as well, and set me up in hope? <laughs> but hush, no more. <laughs> Here's our chief guest. If he had been forgotten, it had been as a gap in our great feast and all thing unbecoming. <laughs> Tonight we hold a solemn supper, sir, and I'll request your presence. Let your highness command upon me, to the which my duties are with the most indissoluble tie for ever knit. Right you this afternoon? Aye, my good lord. We should have else desired your good advice, which still hath been both grave and prosperous in this day's council, but we'll take tomorrow. <laughs> as far you ride. As far, my lord, as to fill up the time twixt this and supper. Go not my horse the better, I must become a borrower of the night for a dark hour or twain. Uh, fail not our feast. My lord, I will not. We hear our bloody cousins are bestowed in England and in Ireland, not confessing their cruel parricide, filling their hearers with strange invention. But of that, Tomorrow, when therewithal we shall have cause of state craving us jointly. Hie you to horse, adieu till you return at night. <laughs> Goes Fleance with you. Aye, my good lord. Our time does call upon I us. I wish your horses swift and sure of foot, and so I do commend you to their backs. A farewell. Let every man be master of his time till seven at night to make society the sweeter welcome. We will keep ourselves till supper time alone. A while then, God be with you. Sirrah, a word with you. Attend those men our pleasure. They are, my lord, without the palace gate. Bring them before us. My lord. To be thus is nothing but to be safely thus. Our fears in Banquo stick deep, and in his royalty of nature reigns that which would be feared. 
his much he dares, and to that dauntless temper of his mind he hath a wisdom that doth guide his valor to act in safety. There is none but he whose being I do fear. And under him my genius is rebuked, as it is said Mark Antony's was by Caesar. He chid the sisters when first they put the name of king upon me and bade them speak to him. Then prophet-like they hailed him, father to a line of kings. Upon my head they placed a fruitless crown and put a barren scepter in my gripe, thence to be wrenched with an unlineal hand, no son of mine succeeding. If it be so, for Banquo's issue have I filed my mind. For them, the gracious Duncan, have I murdered. Put rancors in the vessel of my peace only for them, and mine eternal jewel given to the common enemy of man to make them kings, the seeds of Banquo kings. Rather than so, come fate into the list and champion me to the utterance. Who's there? Those men, my lord, that you did bid me bring. Now go to the door and stay there till we call. Was it not yesterday we spoke together? It was, so please your highness. Well then, now have you considered of my speeches? Know that it was he in the times past which held you so under fortune, which you thought had been our innocent self. This I made good to you in our last conference, passed in probation with you how you were born in hand, how crossed the instruments who wrought with them, and all things else that might to half a soul and to a notion crazed say thus did Manquo. You made it known to us. I did so, and went further, which is now our point of second meeting. Do you find your patience so predominant in your nature that you can let this go? Are you so gospeled to pray for this good man and for his issue, whose heavy hand hath bowed you to the grave and beggared yours forever? I am one, my liege, whom the vile blows and buffets of the world are so incensed that I am reckless what I do to spite the world. And I another, so weary with disasters tugged with fortune, that I would set my life on any chance to mend it or be rid on't. Both of you know Banquo was your enemy. True, my lord. So is he mine, and in such bloody distance that every minute of his being thrusts against my nearest of life. And though I could with bare-faced power sweep him from my sight and bid my will avouch it, yet I must not. For certain friends that are both his and mine, whose loves I may not drop, but wail his fall, who I myself struck down. And thence it is that I, to your assistance, do make love, masking the business from the common eye, for sundry weighty reasons. We shall, my lord, perform what you command us. Though our lives... Your spirit shine through you. Within this hour, at most, I will advise you where to plant yourselves, acquaint you with the perfect spy of the time, the moment aunt, for it must be done tonight, and something from the palace, always, thought that I require a clearness, and with him to leave no rubs nor botches in the work. Cleance, his son that keeps him company, whose absence is no less material to me than is his father's, must embrace the fate of that dark hour. Resolve yourselves apart. I'll come to you anon. We are resolved, my lord. I'll call upon you straight. Abide within, my, my lord. lord. It is concluded. Banquo, thy soul's flight, if it find heaven, must find it out tonight. Banquo gone from court? Aye, madam, but returns again tonight. Say to the king, I would attend his leisure for a few words. Madam, I will. Naught had. All spent where our desire is got without content. It is safer to be that which we destroy than by destruction dwell in doubtful joy. How now, my lord? 
Why do you keep alone of sorriest fancies your companions making, using those thoughts which should indeed have died with them they think on? Things without all remedy should be without regard. What's done is done. We have scorched the snake, not killed it. She'll close and be herself, whilst our poor malice remains in danger of her former tooth. But let the frame of things disjoint. Both the world suffer. Uh, we will eat our meal in fear and sleep in the affliction of these terrible dreams that shake us nightly. Better be with the dead, whom we to gain our peace have sent to peace, and on the torture of the mind to lie in restless ecstasy. Duncan is in his grave. After life's fitful fever, he sleeps well. Treason has done his worst, nor steel, nor poison. Malice domestic, foreign levy, nothing can touch him further. Come on, gentle, my lord. Leak o'er your rugged looks. Be bright and jovial among your guests tonight. So shall I love, and so I pray be you. Let your remembrance apply to Banquo. Present him eminence both with eye and tongue. Unsafe the while that we must lave our honours in these flattering streams and make our faces visards to our heart, disguising what they are. You must leave this. Oh, full of scorpions is my mind, dear wife. Thou knowest that Banquo and his fleance lives. But in them, nature's copy is not eternal. There's comfort yet. They are assailable. <laughs> then be thou jocund. Ere the bat hath flown his cloistered flight, Ere to black Hecate's summons, the shard-born beetle with his drowsy hums hath rung night's yawning peal, there shall be done a deed of dreadful note. What's to be done? Be innocent of the knowledge, dearest Chuck, till thou applaud the deed. Come, sealing night, scarf up the tender eye of pitiful day, and with thy bloody and invisible hand, cancel and tear to pieces that great bond which keeps me pale. Light thickens, and the crow makes wing to the rooky wood. Good things of day begin to droop and drowse, whilst night's black agents to their praise do rouse. Thou marvelst at my words, but hold thee still. Things bad begun make strong themselves by ill. But who did bid thee join us? Macbeth. Thee needs not our mistrust, since he delivers our offices and what we have to do to the direction just. Then stand with us. Aye. The west yet glimmers with some streaks of day. Now spurs the lated traveller apace to gain the timely inn, and near approaches the subject of our watch. Hark. I hear horses. Right there. Oh. Is he? The rest that are within the note of expectation already are in the court. Shh! A light! A light! Tis he! Stand to it. It will be rain tonight. Aye. Let it come down! Uh, no! Treachery! Fly, good fleance! Fly, fly, fly! Oh, Miss Ribby! Oh! Oh. Who did strike out the light? Was not the way? There's 
but one down, the sun is fled. We've lost best half of our affair. Well, let's away and say how much is done. <laughs> you know your own degrees. Sit down. At first and last, the hearty welcome. <laughs> Ourself will mingle with society and play the humble host. Our hostess keeps her state, but in best time, we will require her welcome. <laughs> Pronounce it, call me, sir, to all our friends. For my heart's feet, they are welcome. <laughs> See, they encounter thee with their hearts, thanks. Both sides are even. Here, I'll sit in the midst. Be large in mirth. Anon, we'll drink a measure, the table round. <laughs> There's blood upon thy face. Tis Banquo's then. Tis better thee without than he within. Is he dispatched? My lord, his throat is cut that I did for him. Thou art the best of the cutthroats. Yet he's good that did the like for Fleance. If thou didst it, thou art the non pareil Most royal, sir, Fleance is scapes. <sighs> then comes my fit again. I had else been perfect. Whole as the marble, founded as the rock, as broad and general as the casing air. But now I am cabined, cribbed, confined, bound into saucy doubts and fears. But Banquo's safe. Aye, my good lord, safe in a ditch he bides, with twenty trenched gashes on his head, the least a death to nature. Thanks for that. There the grown serpent lies. The worm that's fled hath nature that in time will venom breed, no teeth for the present. Get thee gone. Tomorrow we'll hear ourselves again. My royal lord, you do not give the cheer. The feast is so that is not often vouched while tis a making. Tis given with welcome. To feed were best at home, from them. The sauce to meet is ceremony, meeting were bare without it. Sweet remembrancer. <laughs> now good digestion, weight on appetite, and health on both. May it please your highness, sit. Here had we now our countries on a roof where the graced person of our Banquo present, <laughs> who may I rather challenge for unkindness than pity for mischance. His absence, sir, lays blame upon his uh, promise. Pleased, your highness, to grace us with your royal company. The table's full. Here is a place reserved, sir. Where? Here, my good lord. Ah. Uh, what is that moves, your highness? Which of you have done this? Thou canst not say I did it. Never shake thy gory locks at me. Gentlemen, rise. His highness is not well. Sit, worthy friends. My lord is often thus, and hath been from his youth. Pray you keep seat, the fit is momentary. Upon a thought he will again be well. If much you note him, you shall offend him and extend his passion. Feed and regard him not. Your Majesty. You are mad. I and a bold one that dare look on that which might appall the devil. Very proper stuff. This is the very painting of your fear. This is the air-drawn dagger which you said led you to Duncan. Oh, these flaws and starts, impostors to true fear, would well become a woman's story at a winter's fire authorized by her granddad. Uh, Shame uh, myself. Why uh, do you make such faces? Uh, when all's done, look but on a stool. Prithee see there. Behold, look low. How say you? Why, what care I if thou canst nod? Speak, too. If charnel houses and our graves must send those we bury back, our monuments shall be the moors of kites. Quite unmanned in folly. If I stand here, I saw him. I for shame. Blood hath been shed ere now in the olden time, ere human statute purged the gentle wheel. Aye, and since, too, murders have been performed too terrible for the ear. The time has been that when the brains were out, the man would die and there an end. But now they rise again with twenty mortal murders on their crowns and push us from our stools. This is more strange than such a murder is. My worthy lord, your noble friends do lack you. I do forget. 
Do not muse at me, my most worthy friends. I have a strange infirmity, which is nothing to those that know me. Come, love and health to all, then I'll sit down. Give me some wine, fill full. I drink to the general joy of the whole table and to our dear friend Banquo, whom we miss. Would he were here. To all and him we thirst and all to all. Under his hallowed and quit my sight. Let the earth hide thee. Thy bones are marrowless, thy blood is cold. Thou hast no speculation in those eyes which thou dost glare with. Think of this good peer as but as a thing of custom. Tis no other. Only it spoils the pleasure of the time. What man dare I dare? Approach thou like the rugged Russian bear, the armed rhinoceros, or the Hurkan tiger. Take any shape but that, and my firm nerves shall never tremble. Or be alive again, and bear me to the desert with thy sword. If trembling I inhabit, then protest me the baby of a girl. Hence, horrible shadow, unreal mockery. Hence! <sighs> Was so. Being gone, I am a man again. Pray you, sit still. The place the mirth broke the good meeting with most admired disorder. Can such things be and overcome us like a summer's cloud without our special wonder? You make me strange, even to the disposition that I owe when now I think you can behold such sights and keep the natural ruby of your cheeks when mine is blanched with fear. What sights, my lord? I pray you, speak not. He grows worse and worse. Question enrages him. At once, good night. Stand not upon the order of your going, but go at once. Good night, Majesty. and better health attend his majesty. A kind good night to all. Good night. Good night. It will have blood. They say blood will have blood. Stones have been known to move and trees to speak. Augurs and understood relations have by magopies and chuffs and rooks brought forth the secret man of blood. What is the night? Almost at odds with morning, which is which. How says thou that Macduff denies his person at our great bidding? Did you send to him, sir? I hear it by the way, but I will send. There's not a one of them, but in his house I keep a servant feed. I will tomorrow. And betimes I will to the weird sisters. More shall they speak. For now I am bent to know by the worst means the worst. For mine own good, all causes shall give way. I am in blood stepped in so far that should I wade no more, returning were as tedious as go o'er. Strange things I have in head that will to hand, which must be acted ere they may be scanned. You lack the season of all natures. Sleep. Come, wheel to sleep. My strange and self-abuse is the initiate fear that wants hard use. We are yet but young indeed. Once the hedge pig whine. Up your cries, tis time, tis time. Double, double, double toil and trouble. Fire burn and, and cauldron and bottle. By the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. <sighs> Open locks, whoever knocks. How oh, now, you secret black and midnight hags? What is to do? A, a deed, deed without, without a name. name. 
I conjure you by that which you profess, however you come to know it, answer me. Though you untie winds and let them fight against the churches, though the yesty waves confound and swallow navigation up, though bladed corn be lodged and trees blown down, though castles topple on their warders' heads, though palaces and pyramids do slope their heads to their foundations, though the treasure of nature's German tumble altogether even till destruction sicken, answer me to what I ask you. Speak, demand. We'll answer. Say, if thou'd rather hear it from our mouths or from our masters. Call them. Let me see them. Come high or low, thyself and office deftly show. Tell me, thou unknown power. He knows thy thought. Hear his speech, but say thou not. Macbeth, Macbeth, Macbeth. Beware Macduff, beware the thane of Fife. Dismiss me, enough. Whatever thou art for thy good caution, thanks, thou hast harped my fear aright. But one word more. He will not be commanded. Here's another, more potent than the first. Macbeth, Macbeth, Macbeth. Had I three ears, I'd hear thee. Be bloody, bold, and resolute. Laugh to scorn the power of man. For none of woman born shall harm Macbeth. <laughs> then live, Macduff, what need I fear of thee? But yet I'll make assurance double sure and take a bond of fate. Thou shalt not live that I may tell pale-hearted fear it lies and sleep in spite of thunder. What is this that rises like the issue of a king and wears upon his baby brow the round and top of sovereignty? Listen. But, but speak not, not to it. it. Be lion mettled, proud, and take no care who chafes, who frets, or where conspirers are. Macbeth shall never vanquished be until great Burnham Wood to high Dunsinane Hill shall come against him. <laughs> that will never be. Who can impress the forest? Bid the tree unfix his earthbound root. Sweet bodements. Good. Rebellious head rise never till the wood of Burnham rise. And our high placed Macbeth shall live the lease of nature. Pay his breath to time and mortal custom. Yet my heart throbs to know one thing. Tell me if your art can tell so much. Shall Banquo's issue ever reign in this kingdom? Seek to know no more. I will be satisfied. Deny me this and an eternal curse fall on you. Let me know. Why sinks that cauldron? And what noise is this? Show. 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 Show his eyes and grieve his heart. Come like shadows. So depart. Thou art too like the spirit of Vanquo. Down, thy crown does sear mine eyeballs, and thy hair, thou other gold bound brow, is like the first. A third is like the former. Filthy hags, why do you show me this? A fourth, start eyes. What will the line stretch out to the crack of doom? Another yet, a seventh, I'll see no more. And yet an eighth appears, who bears a glass which shows me many more. And some I see the twofold balls and treble scepters carry. Horrible sight! Now I see it is true, for the blood bolt at Banquo smiles upon me and points at them for his. What? Is this so? Aye, sir, this is so. <laughs> Where are they? Gone? Let this pernicious hour stand, I accursed in the calendar.
Come in without there. What's your grace's will? Saw you the weird sisters? No, my lord. Came they not by you? No, indeed, my lord. Infected be the air whereon they ride and damned all those that trust them. I did hear the galloping of horse. Who wast came by? Tis two or three, my lord, that bring you word Macduff is fled to England. Fled to England? Aye, my good lord. Time. Thou anticipatest my dread exploits. The flighty purpose never is o'ertook unless the deed go with it. From this moment, the very firstlings of my heart shall be the firstlings of my hand. And even now, to crown my thoughts with acts, be it thought and done. The castle of Macduff I will surprise. Seize upon Fife. Give to the edge of the sword his wife, his babes, and all the unfortunate souls that trace him in his line. No, boasting like a fool, this deed I'll do before this purpose cool. But no more sights. What had he done to make him fly the land? You must have patience, madam. He had none. His flight was madness. When our actions do not our fears do make us traitors. You know not whether it was his wisdom or his fear. Wisdom? To leave his wife, to leave his babes, his mansion and his titles in a place from whence himself does fly. He loves us not. He wants the natural touch. For the poor wren, the most diminutive of birds, will fight her young ones in her nest against the owl. All is the fear, and nothing is the love. As little is the wisdom, where the flight so runs its sense all. <laughs> My dearest cause, I pray you school yourself. <laughs> but for your husband, he is noble, wise, <laughs> judicious, and best knows the fits of the season. <laughs> I dare not speak much further, but cruel are the times when we are traitors and do not know ourselves. When we hold rumor from what we fear, yet know not what we fear, but float upon a wild and violent sea each way and move. I'll take my leave of you. Shall not be long, but I'll be here again. Things at the worst will cease, or else climb upward to what they were before. My pretty cousin, blessing upon you. Fathered he is, and yet he's fatherless. I am so much a fool. Should I stay longer, it would be my disgrace and your discomfort. I take my leave at once. Sarah, your father's dead. And what will you do now? How will you live? What birds do, mother? What? With worms and flies? With what I get, I mean. And so do they. Poor bird. That's never fear the net, nor lime, the pitfall, nor the gin. Why should I, mother? Poor birds they are not set for. My father is not dead for all your saying. Yes, he is dead. Was my father a traitor, mother? Aye, that he was. What is a traitor? Why, one that swears and lies. And be all traitors that do so? Everyone that does so is a traitor and must be hanged. And must they all be hanged? That swear and lie? Every one. Who must hang them? Why? <laughs> the honest men. Then the liars and swearers are fools. For there are liars and swearers enow to beat the honest men and hang up them. Now, God help thee, poor monkey. How wilt thou do for the father? If he were dead, you'd weep for him. If you would not, it were a good sign that I should quickly have a new father. Poor prattler. How thou talkest. Bless you, fair dame. What? I am not to you known, though in your state of honour I am perfect. I doubt some danger does approach you nearly. Oh. If you will take a homely man's advice, be not found here. Hence with your little ones. Oh, what? Where? Heaven preserve you. I dare abide no longer. Oh, where, whither should I fly? I have done no harm. But I remember now I am in this earthly world. Where to do harm is often laudable, to do good sometime accounted dangerous folly. Why then, alas, do I put up that womanly defence to say I have done no harm? <gasps> oh. What are these faces? Where is your husband? 
I hope in no place so unsanctified where such as thou mayst find him. <laughs> He's a traitor. Thou liest, thou shaggy villain. What, you egg? Young fry of treachery! Oh, he has killed me, mother. Run away, I pray you. <laughs> Murder! Let us seek out some desolate shade, and there weep our sad bosoms empty. Let us rather hold fast the mortal sword and like good men bestride our downfallen birthdom. Each new morn, new widows howl, new orphans cry, new sorrows strike heaven on the face, that it resounds as if it felt with Scotland and yelled out like syllable of dolor. What I believe I'll wail, what no believe. And what I can redress, as I shall find the time to friend, I will. What you have spoke, it may be so, perchance. This tyrant whose sole name blisters our tongues was once thought honest. You have loved him well. He hath not touched you yet. I am young, but something you may deserve of him through me. And wisdom, to offer up a weak, poor, innocent lamb to appease an angry god. I am not treacherous. But Macbeth is. A good and virtuous nature may recoil in an imperial charge. But I shall crave your pardon. That which you are, my thoughts cannot transpose. Angels are bright still, though the brightest fell. Though all things foul would wear the brows of grace, yet grace must still look so. I have lost my hope. Perchance, even there, where I did find my doubts. Why in that rawness left you wife and child? those precious motives, those strong knots of love without leave-taking. I pray you, let not my jealousies be your dishonors, but mine own safeties. You may be rightly just, whatever I shall think. Bleed, bleed, poor country. Great tyranny, lay thou thy basis sure, for goodness dare not check thee. Wear thou thy wrongs, the title is afeard. Fare thee well, Lord. I would not be the villain that thou thinkst for the whole space that's in the tyrant's grasp and the rich east to boot. Be not offended. I speak not as in absolute fear of you. I think our country sinks beneath the yoke. It weeps, it bleeds, and each new day her gash is added to her wounds. I think with all there would be hands uplifted in my right. And here from gracious England have I offered of goodly thousands. What I am... Truly, is thine and my poor country's to command. Whither indeed before thy here approach, old Seaward with ten thousand warlike men already at a point was setting forth. Now we're together, and the chance of goodness be like our warranted quarrel. Why are you silent? Such welcome and unwelcome things at once is hard to reconcile. See who comes here. My countryman, but yet I know him not. My ever gentle cousin, welcome hither. I know him now. Good God, betimes remove the means that makes us strangers. Uh, amen to that. Ban Scotland where it did. Alas, poor country, almost afraid to know itself. It cannot be called our mother, but our grave, where nothing but who knows nothing is once seen to smile. Where sighs and groans and shrieks that rent the air are made, not marked. Where violent sorrow seems a modern ecstasy. The dead man's knell is there scarce asked for who. And good men's lives expire before the flowers in their caps. Dying or ere they sicken. No relation, too nice and yet too true. What's the newest grief? That of an hour's age doth hiss the speaker. Each minute teems a new one. How does my wife? Why, well. And all my children? Well, too. The tyrant has not battered at their peace. No, they were well at peace when I did leave them. Be not a niggard of your speech. How ghosts? When I came hither to transport the tidings which I have heavily borne, there ran a rumor 
of many worthy fellows that were out, which was to my belief witnessed the rather, for that I saw the tyrant's power afoot. Now is the time of help. Your eye in Scotland would create soldiers, make our women fight to doff their dire distress. Be it their comfort, we are coming thither. Gracious England hath lent us good seaward with 10,000 men, an older and a better soldier none than Christendom gives out. Would I could answer this comfort with the like. But I have words that would be howled out in the desert air where hearing should not latch them. What concern they? The general cause? Or is it a fee grief due to some single breast? And no mind that's honest, but in it shares some woe, though the main part pertains to you alone. If it be mine, keep it not from me. Quickly, let me have it. Let not your ears despise my tongue forever, which shall possess them with the heaviest sound that ever yet they heard. Ah. Your castle is surprised, your wife and babe savagely slaughtered. To relate the manner where on the quarry of these murdered deer to add the death of you. Merciful heaven. What man, ne'er pull your hat upon your brows. Give sorrow words. The grief that does not speak whispers the o'erfraught heart and bids it break. My children, too. Wife, children, servants, all that could be found. And I must be from thence. My wife killed too. I have said. Be comforted. Let's make us medicines of our great revenge to cure this deadly grief. He has no children. All, my pretty one. Did you say all? Oh, right. Oh, but oh, my pretty chickens and their dam at one fell swoop. Dispute it like a man. I shall do so, but I must also feel it as a man. I cannot but remember such things were that were most precious. Did heaven look on and would not take their part? Sinful Macduff. They were all struck for thee, naught that I am. Not for their own demerits, but for mine, fell slaughter on their souls. Heaven rest them now. Be this the whetstone of your sword. Let grief convert to anger. Blunt not the heart in rage. Oh, I could play the woman with mine eyes and braggart with my tongue. But gentle heavens cut short all intermission. Front to front bring thou this fiend of Scotland and myself. Within my sword's length set him. This tune goes manly. Come, go we to the king. Our power is ready. Our lack is nothing but our leave. Macbeth is ripe for shaking, and the powers above put on their instruments. Receive what cheer you may. The night is long that never finds the day. I have two nights watched with you, but can perceive no truth in your report. When was it she last walked? Since His Majesty went into the field, I have seen her rise from her bed, throw her nightgown upon her, unlock her closet, take forth paper, fold it, write upon it, read it, afterwards seal it, and again return to bed. Yet all this while in a most fast sleep. A great perturbation in nature to receive at once the benefit of sleep and do the effects of watching. In this slumbery agitation, besides her walking and other actual performances, what at any time have you heard her say? That, sir, which I will not report after her. You may to me, and tis most meet you should. Neither to you nor anyone, having no witness to confirm my speech. 
Here she comes. This is her very guise. Upon my life, fast asleep. Observe her. Stand close. How came she by that light? Why, it stood by her. She has light by her continually. It is her command. You see, her eyes are open. Aye, but their sense is shut. What is it she does now? Look how she rubs her hands. It is an accustomed action with her to see me thus washing her hands. I have known her continue in this a quarter of an hour. Yes. Yes, a spot. Hark, she speaks. I will set down what comes from her to satisfy my remembrance the more strongly. Out. Damn that spot. Out, I say. One, two. I had this time to do it. Oh, it's murky. By my lord, by a soldier and a feared. What need we fear? Who knows it? when none can call our power to account. Ah. And who would have thought the old man to have had so much blood in him? Do you mark that? A vein of five had a wife. Where is she now? Oh, his hands perfectly. No more of that, my lord. No more of that. You mar all with this starting. Go to, go to. Yes. You have known what you should not. She has spoke what she should not, I'm sure of that. Heaven knows what she has known. The smell of the blood still. All the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. <sighs> What a sigh is there. The heart is sorely charged. I would not have such a heart in my bosom for the dignity of the whole body. Well, well, well. Pray God it be, sir. This disease is beyond my practice, yet I have known those which have walked in their sleep who have died holily in their beds. Wash your hands. Put on your nightcap. Look not so pale. I tell you yet again, Banker's buried. He cannot come out on his grave. Even so. The bed, the bed, has knocking at the gate. Come, 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 come. Give me your hand. What's done cannot be undone. The bed, the bed, the bed. Will she go now to bed? Directly. Foul whisperings are abroad. Unnatural deeds do breed unnatural troubles. Infected minds to their deaf pillows will discharge their secrets. More needs she the divine than the physician. God, God, forgive us all. Look after her. Remove from her the means of all annoyance and still keep eyes upon her. So, good night. My mind she has mated and amazed my sight. I think, but dare not speak. The English power is near, led on by Malcolm, his uncle Seward, and the good Macduff. Revenges burn in them, for their dear causes would to the bleeding and the grim alarm excite the mortified man. Near Burnham Wood shall we meet them. That way are they coming. Who knows if Donald Bain be with his brother? For certain, sir, he is not. I have a file of all the gentry. There is Seaward's son and many unrough youths that even now protest their first manhood. What does the tyrant? Great Dunsinane he strongly fortifies. Some say he's mad. Others that lesser hate him do call it valiant fury. But for certain, he cannot buckle his distempered cause within the belt of rule. Now does he feel his secret murder sticking on his hands. Now minutely, revolts upbraid his faith breach. Those he commands move only in command, nothing in love. 
Now does he feel his title hang loose about him like a giant's robe upon a dwarfish thief. Who then shall blame his pestered senses to recoil and start when all that is within him does condemn itself for being there? Well, march we on to give obedience where it is truly owed. Meet we the medicine of the sickly wheel, and with him pour we in our country's purge each drop of us. Or so much as it needs to dew the sovereign flower and drown the weeds. Make we our march toward Burnham. Let them fly all. Ha! Till Burnham would remove to Dunsinane, I cannot taint with fear. What's the boy Malcolm? Was he not born of woman? The spirits that do know all mortal consequences have pronounced me thus. Fear not, Macbeth. No man that's born of woman shall e'er have power upon thee. Then fly false thanes and mingle with the English epicures. <laughs> the mind I sway by and the heart I bear shall never sag with doubt nor shake with fear. Sir, sir. The devil damn thee, black thou cream-faced loon. Where got thou that goose look? There is ten thousand. Geese, villain. Soldier, sir. Go, prick thy face and overread thy fear, thou lily-livered boy. Oh. What soldier's patch? Oh. Death of thy soul, those linen cheeks of thine are counselors to fear. What soldier's way face? The English force so please you. Sir, take thy face, hand. Oh. Seaton. I am sick at heart when I behold. Seaton, I say. This push will cheer me ever or deceit me now. I have lived long enough. My way of life is fallen into the seer, the yellow leaf. And that which should accompany old age as honor, love, obedience, troops of friends, I must not look to have. But in their stead, curses, not loud but deep, mouth honor, breath which the poor heart would fain deny and dare not. See, Dan. What your gracious pleasure. What news more? All is confirmed, my lord, which was reported. I'll fight till from my bones my flesh be hacked. Give me my armor. It is not needed yet. I'll put it on. Send out more horses, scur the country round. Hang those that talk of fear. Give me mine armor. How does your patient, doctor? Not so sick, my lord, as she is troubled with thick coming fancies that keep her from her rest. Cure her of that. Canst thou not minister to a mind diseased? Pluck from the memory a rooted sorrow, raise out the written troubles of the brain, and with some sweet oblivious antidote cleanse the stuffed bosom of that perilous stuff which weighs upon the heart. Therein the patient must minister to himself. Throw physic to the dogs, I own none of it. Come, put mine armor on, give me my staff, seat and send out. Doctor, the thanes fly from me. Come, sir, dispatch. If thou couldst, doctor. Cast the water of my lamb, find her disease, and purge it to a sound and pristine health. I would applaud thee to the very echo that would applaud again. Pull it off, I say. What rhubarb senna or what purgative drug would scour these English hands? Hearst thou of them? Aye, my good lord, your royal preparation makes us hear something. Bring it after me. I will not be afraid of death and bane till Burnham Forest come to Dunsinane. Were I from Dunsinane away and clear, profit again should hardly draw me here. Cousins, 
I hope the days are near at hand. The chambers will be safe. We doubt it nothing. What wood is this before us? The wood of Burnham. Let every soldier hew him down a bow and bear it before him. Thereby shall we shadow the numbers of our host and make discovery err in report of us. We learn no other, but the confident tyrant keeps still in Dunsinane and will endure our sitting down before it. Tis his main hope, for where there is advantage to be gone, both more and less have given him the revolt, and none serve with him but constrained things, whose hearts are absent too. Let our just censures attend the true event and put we on industrious soldiership. The time approaches, toward which advance the war! Hang out our banners on the outward walls! The cry is still they come. Our castle strength will laugh a siege to scorn. Here let them lie, till famine and the egg you eat them up. Were they not forced with those that should be ours, we might have met them dareful, beard to beard, and beat them backward home. <gasps> Whence is that noise? Is the cry of women, my good lord. I have almost forgot the taste of fears. The time has been my senses would have cooled to hear a night shriek, and my fell of hair would at a dismal treatise rouse and stir as life were in it. I have supped full with horrors. Dioness familiar to my slaughterous thoughts cannot once start me. Wherefore was that cry? The queen, my lord, is dead. She should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow, creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Lord. Thou comes to use thy tongue, thy story, quickly. Gracious, my lord, I I should report that which I say I saw, but know not how to do it. Well, say, sir. As I did stand my watch upon the hill, I looked toward Burnham, and anon methought the wood began to move. Liar! And slave! Let me endure your wrath, if it be not so. Within this three mile may you see it coming. I say a moving grove. If thou speaks false upon the next tree, shalt thou hang alive till famine cling thee. If thy speech be sooth, I care not if thou dost for me as much. I pull in resolution and begin to doubt the equivocation of the fiend that lies like truth. Fear not, till Burnham Wood do come to Dunsinane, and now a wood comes toward Dunsinane. Arm, arm, and out! If this which here vouches does appear, there is no flying hence, no tarrying here. I begin to be a weary of the sun, and wish the estate of the world were now undone. Ring the alarm bell, blow wind, come rack, 
at least we'll die with harness on our back. Now near enough, your leafy screens throw down and show like those you are. You worthy uncle shall with my cousin, your right noble son, lead our first battle. Worthy Macduff and we shall take upon us what else remains to do, according to our order. Fare you well. If we would find the tyrant's power tonight, let us be beaten if we cannot fight. Make all our trumpets speak. Give them all breath. Those clamorous harbingers of blood and death. Tied me to a stake, I cannot fly, but bear like I must fight the course. What's he that was not born of woman? Such a one I am to fear, or none. What is thy name? Thou'lt be afraid to hear it. No, thou art called thyself a harder name than any is in hell. My name's Macbeth. The devil himself could not pronounce a title more hateful to mine ear. No, no more fearful. Oh, thou liest upon a tyrant. With my sword, I'll prove the lie thou speak. <laughs> <laughs> Thou wast born of woman. At swords I smile at, weapons laugh to scorn. Brandished by man that's of a woman born. That way the noise is. Tyrant, show thy face. If thou beest slain and with no stroke of mine, my wife and children's ghosts will haunt me still. I cannot strike at wretched kerns whose arms are hired to bear their staves. Either thou, Macbeth, or else my sword with an unbattered edge I sheathe again undeeded. There shouldst thou be. By this great clatter, one of greatest note seems bruited. Let me find him fortune, and more I beg not. <laughs> This way, my lord, the castle's gently rendered. The tyrant's people on both sides do fight. The noble thanes do bravely in the war. The day almost itself professes yours, and little is to do. I have met with foes that strike beside us. Enter, sir, the castle. <laughs> Why should I play the Roman fool and die on mine own sword while I see lives the gashes do better on them? Turn! Hellhound, turn! Of all men else I have avoided thee, but get thee back. My soul is too much charged with blood of thine already. I have no words. My voice is in my sword, thou bloodier villain than terms can give thee out. <laughs> thou losest labour. <laughs> as easy mayst thou the entrenchant air with thy keen sword impress as make me bleed. Let fall thy blade on vulnerable crests. I bear a charmed life which must not yield to one of woman born. Despair thy charm. And let the angel whom thou still hast served tell thee Macduff was from his mother's womb untimely ripped. A curse be that tongue that tells me so, for it hath cowed my better part of man. And be these juggling fiends no more believed that porter with us in a double sense, that keep the word of promise to our ear and break it to our hope. I'll not fight with thee. Then 
Yield thee, coward, and live to be the show and gaze of the time. We'll have thee as our rarer monsters are, painted upon a pole and under it. Here may you see the tyrant. I will not yield to kiss the ground before young Malcolm's feet and to be baited with the rabble's curse. Though Burnham would be come to Dunsinane, and thou opposed being of no woman born, yet I will try the last. Before my body, I throw my warlike shield. Lay on Macduff, and damned be him which first cries, Hold him up! <laughs> With the friends we miss were safe arrived. Some must go off, and yet by these I see so great a day as this is cheaply bought. Macduff is missing, and your noble son. Your son, my lord, has paid a soldier's debt. He only lived but till he was a man, the which no sooner had his prowess confirmed in the unshrinking station where he fought, but like a man he died. Then he is dead. Aye, and brought off the field. Your cause of sorrow must not be measured by his worth, for then it hath no end. Had he his hurts before? Aye, on the front. Why then, God's soldier be he. Had I as many sons as I have hairs, I would not wish them to a fairer death. And so his knell is nulled. He's worth more sorrow, and that I'll spend for him. He's worth no more. They say he parted well and paid his score. So God be with him. Here comes newer comfort. Hail, King, for so thou art. Behold where stands the usurper's cursed head. The time is free. I see thee compassed with thy kingdom's pearl that speak my salutation in their minds, whose voices I desire aloud with mine. Hail, King of Scotland! Hail, King of Scotland! We shall not spend a large expense of time before we reckon with your several loves and make us even with you. My thanes and kinsmen, henceforth be earls, the first that ever Scotland in such an honour named. What's more to do, which would be planted newly with the time, as calling home our exiled friends abroad, that fled the snares of watchful tyranny, producing forth the cruel ministers of this dead butcher and his fiend-like queen, who, as tis thought, by self and violent hands took off her life. This and what needful else that calls upon us, by the grace of grace, we will perform in measure, time, and place. So thanks to all at once, and to each one, whom we invite to see us crowned at Schoon.
In that BBC World Theatre production of the tragedy by William Shakespeare, the part of Macbeth was played by Paul Schofield, and that of Lady Macbeth by Peggy Ashcroft. Macduff was played by Alec McCowan, Lady Macduff by Jane Wenham, and Malcolm by David Weston. The music was composed by John Buckland, and the play was produced by John Tidyman.